For some reason, sound and presentation are often hard for me to fit into a review. I don't know, I think I just focus so much on the gameplay and the mechanics and whatnot that it takes a lot of effort to transition naturally into that stuff. How fortunate then that we've got an entire chunk of this review to talk about it without interruptions. Because oh man, I gotta tell you guys, Breath of the Wild is a pretty game for both your eyes and your ears. But let's start with eyes. Nintendo is used to using below par hardware in order to provide a more affordable console. They've been doing it for over a decade now. They're also used to getting the absolute most out of their hardware in both technical and artistic terms. Breath of the Wild is a classic example of art style winning out over sheer graphical power. Because honestly, on paper, the game ain't much in the graphics department. Character models are a little simplistic and they use that Wind Waker-esque style of cell shading so they don't have as much texturing or detail. There are no dazzling particle effects or anything like that. Very little of the game's visuals could be considered complex, maybe outside of the humongous divine beasts or something. Performance is really where it suffers most. The frame rate sometimes has a hard time keeping up with the action on screen. It's not usually so bad that it becomes a distraction, but it's certainly not the kind of performance I've come to expect with a first party Nintendo game. It slows considerably in Kakariko Village and slows even more in Korok Forest, to the point where I'm honestly surprised they allowed the game to ship this way. It's really bizarre playing a Zelda title where the game stutters this much. The game's resolution ain't the best, but it ain't terrible either. Like many Switch games, it seems to scale depending on what's going on, employing all different kinds of rendering techniques and layers of anti-aliasing and whatnot to different things in order to keep the balance between visuals and frame rate as much as possible. I have no doubt that this often does make things look and run better than they could, but other times it makes things look disturbingly inconsistent. We see patches of textures jumping around and objects with polygon counts that scale up and down very visibly. Now I can see that this was the sacrifice they needed to make in order to create a world that was constant, truly open. There are no loading screens on this map. You can run from one end to the other, climb the highest mountain, go into a town, a house even, then out again and all the way to Hyrule Castle and up through the entire thing and up to Ganon's weird goopy pod thing and you'll never have to stop to load once. It really is impressive. And with a world this big, you wanna be able to see as much as possible from a distance without pop-in, which means just about everything is always rendered in some fashion if it's visible to you. And that's why you have this active resolution scaling system that makes one thing smooth and one thing jagged and another thing smooth and then jagged. It also makes the landscape, in a way, a little less pretty than it probably could have been. It's certainly pretty for reasons we'll talk about in a bit, but if you saw my first impressions video, you'll remember that I found it a little more muddy than I expected. Distant mountains just look a little bit yucky when you look at them long enough, like when you really focus on them. And let me tell you now, all this bad stuff is leading up to a lot of good stuff, and again, this was all done in order to achieve that complete openness, that ability to look at everything from any angle. They didn't have the benefit of pre-rendering a bunch of perfect picturesque landscapes, and that's of course a very fine trade-off. It means the game performs the way they wanted it to with little to no pop-in. For the most part, people and monsters are the only things that pop in, though you can usually see them from far enough away that it's not a big problem. The only monster that proves troublesome in this regard is the Hinox. You can be pretty darn close to the thing before, boink, it's suddenly there. And this is of course more of a problem because the Hinox is the biggest baddie in the game. You always want to be able to plan where you're going and know for the most part what you'll find when you get there, but Hinoxes can sometimes surprise you. At least they're always sleeping, so you know, they won't see you unless you run up real close. But seeing one of their big circular sleeping spots ahead of you for ages before the game decides to populate it can be jarring. Enough of that though, despite the game's visual shortcomings, it's still positively gorgeous. Even if no single piece of it is technically impressive or particularly sharp, all the elements combine together to paint one very beautiful picture. It really is much like a painting in that regard. Up close the brush strokes can look pretty rough and nothing is very finely detailed, but when you step back it all comes together because the artist knew exactly how to achieve the overall image they wanted using all those individual pieces. If there's one single most important element that makes the game look so good, it's probably the lighting. I mean Breath of the Wild single-handedly taught me how huge good lighting can be in a game. You spend so much time out in the wilderness running around under the sky so that day-night cycle is ever moving, and no matter what time of day it is, you're treated to a visual feast. Cloud cover is basically constant, so you never get plain old bright sun shining on a blue sky. You get beautiful shades of color that paint the world differently depending on where the sun is or where the clouds shift. Rainy weather has never felt more real in a Zelda game. It's never done so much to affect the atmosphere. Running through moonlight is simply stunning, and if you happen to find yourself in view of the 
ocean when the sun comes up, it's a particularly splendid sight. It doesn't matter how many times I see it happen or how long I play the game. When that sun starts to come up, I stop and I take a moment. I watch the light grow on the horizon, delighting in the vibrant colors as they fill up the sky. And speaking of colors, part of the reason the lighting is so effective is the game's use of a very soft color palette. Gentle greens and browns and yellows make up the bulk of what you'll see in the world above. There are some times when I do miss more vibrant colors. Whenever I use Breath of the Wild footage in a video, I've got to crank up the contrast a good few notches to make it pop a little more on screen. Last gen, the game industry fell into this weird thing where everything was really brown, and I've really appreciated recent efforts to use the full color spectrum. I mean, look at something like Horizon Zero Dawn. It's gorgeous. However, Breath of the Wild's minimalistic use of color helps achieve two things. And in fact, these are two things that the game does on a broad scale and that run through every aspect of its presentation and sound design, as you will soon see. Sticking to the subject of color for the time being, though, the first thing is that the game has this theme of age, of, uh, of history. I can't exactly think of one word to describe it, but it elicits feelings of time gone by. The soft color makes it look like old film or an old photograph or a painting. It feels like it comes from a time when people just didn't have access to bright, high contrast colors in visual mediums. This is a reflection of the state the world is in. Hyrule was ravaged by Ganon's forces so long ago and much of the game is about tapping into the past, recovering memories, accomplishing tasks that others couldn't a hundred years ago. Time has passed, but in terms of civilization, the world hasn't really been able to move on and completely heal. It's basically just as it was back then, much as though it were a photograph. The other thing the game is going for, and that is very much supported by the color palette, is establishing atmosphere. Now, the interesting thing here is that up until now, atmosphere in a Zelda game pretty much meant one of two things, happy or scary. The atmosphere being established was either the bright, happy cartoonishness of Wind Waker and a few others, or the dark, eerie foreboding we saw in games like Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess. But Breath of the Wild is different. The atmosphere it creates is one of serenity. It's relaxing, it's peaceful, it's beautiful. Which is funny because never before has a Zelda game been this dangerous and demanding, but of course we'll really talk about that later. Now this isn't to say that no Zelda ever has gone for a kind of atmosphere that is neither happy and silly nor scary. It's obviously more complicated than that. But off the top of my head, every instance of a calm atmosphere in a Zelda game, aided by atmospheric music, places that really make you stop and just take it in, they almost always carried something of an eeriness to them. Staring up at the architecture in Ocarina of Time's Temple of Time while the Song of Time plays like a Gregorian chant, it was effective but also very somber, almost demanding of a respectful reverence. The snowy area in Twilight Princess, it's serene, but danger lurks just beneath the surface. Strange wolves are stalking you, you're chasing a monster, you don't know what you'll find up on the mountain. The list goes on. To my knowledge, the Zelda team has never zeroed in on the sheer beauty of the world and of nature itself as they have in Breath of the Wild. At the very least, they've never featured it as a theme that runs through an entire game. Ganon tried to conquer the world. There was a huge war, tons of people died, entire villages were destroyed, there was fire everywhere, it was a gigantic mess. And yet, the deer don't know that. The grass doesn't care. The sun and the moon keep on going up and coming down. Sure, maybe if Ganon were to finally win and dominate everything before him, nature would have a problem with it. But here, nature is just nature and nature is beautiful. It's indifferent to your adventuring or all the monsters that are everywhere or the war that went down a hundred years ago. It's the same as it is in the real world and it's a fascinating thing to see in a Zelda game. And of course it makes traversing the landscape that much more enjoyable. That atmosphere grants the player with a near constant feeling of calm. But now that we're past color, let's start talking about art direction. Character designs are interesting because we've got a really big range of complexity here. Hylians and the Sheikah, which for all intents and purposes are Zelda's human characters are quite plain. Like, surprisingly so. They just look like people without a lot of really striking standout features. And the funny thing is, I kinda like it that way. The rest of the world is so astoundingly beautiful that the people themselves become something like the background. They just don't need to look more detailed than they do. And in fact, this is an interesting thing to look at in past Zelda games. In Wind Waker, for instance, I was fine with weird looking characters because the whole world was like a colorful cartoon. It all meshed. 
But as much as I loved Twilight Princess, I remember being a little distracted by some of the characters. The world was dark and largely realistic, but you still had these weirdly cartoony dudes with bizarre faces and they didn't seem to fit very well. The Hylians and Sheikah in Breath of the Wild are simple, but that perfectly matches the simple beauty of the world. But then of course, to keep things interesting, you've got your less human-like races, your Zoras, Gorons, Gerudo, and Rito. Imaginary races are what really stick out in a fantasy world, and as such, these are designed appropriately. They really pop, they catch your attention. The Zora and the Rito, fish people and bird people respectively, have very unique designs here. They're much more like animals and less like humans than they were in previous games. I mean, the Rito used to just look like people with feathers glued to their arms and beaks glued over their noses. Here, the Rito really look like bird people. The Zora really look like fish people. And there are different designs for different characters using different species as reference points. This Zora is like a hammerhead shark. This one's like some kind of ray. That Rito there is kind of like an eagle. This one is obviously a parrot. Then the Gorons look fantastic as Gorons tend to do. I will say they lack the same creativity seen in Twilight Princess with the Goron elders in particular, but there's definitely a great range of character models on display. And if there's one thing these Gorons do better than any others, it's convey emotion. Facial animations are superb and their great big faces show them off better than any other race in the game. Plus, more of them have got hair now. I mean, that sends the personality potential through the roof. Lastly, you've got Gerudo, and the developers obviously had a lot of fun tweaking the original design here. Just like Gerudo of old, they've got darker skin and angular faces with large noses, but much greater emphasis has now been put on their height, specifically how much taller they are than most of the other races. They've also got, well, Let's just say, very interesting body shapes. While we're talking about the people of Breath of the Wild, let's talk about the architecture. Each race has its own building style, and every town looks wildly different, adding a nice layer to the world's sense of realism. The Hylians have Hateno, an idyllic little village nestled in the hills, and Lurlin, an oceanside trading settlement. The Sheikah have their mountain village that utilizes ancient Japanese-style architecture. In fact, much like the Yiga clan, who broke off from the Sheikah, their entire culture is very Japanese. Once again, though, these pale in comparison to Hyrule's more fantastical races. You've got Gerudo Town, which is reminiscent of ancient desert-dwelling cultures. There's probably one specific one it's based on, but obviously I didn't pay attention in history class. Is it Egypt? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's probably Egypt. That might be the least impressive one though, and probably because the Gerudo are closest to humans out of the four unique races, so that naturally made the designers want to model their culture after real ones. Zora's domain though is easily the most impressive. Let me tell you folks, these Zora have come a long way since living in caves in Ocarina of Time. Here they're natural architects, and they've built a city above the water in a big mountaintop basin that glistens with luminous stone and other natural deposits. The design is complex and beautiful. It reminds you of the ocean, but it's also sort of futuristic. Easily the most visually spectacular individual area of the game. And it's cool because it reflects the Zora culture. They've got a long and storied history of fighting wars and of heroic champions. They've got a throne room with a monarch who sits on a throne and their ceremonial scepters and all that. It's all very fitting. Compare this to the Gorons who just kind of live in caves like usual. The style here is much more down to earth. The Gorons don't do fancy. They're practical. They're hard workers and that's about it. The structures are roughly hewn and you've got metal bits and equipment lying around everywhere. The lava and the overall on fire atmosphere certainly make it interesting, but I think going into the game, I was hoping for a little more. The Zoras just set my expectations so high, you know? But even though this is called Goron City, that's really a stupid name because it's not a city at all. It's, it's barely a village. It's very tiny and kind of grouped together. I was hoping for some staggering mountain city with all sorts of levels and stuff to check out like in Ocarina of Time, but I will certainly say this way still works perfectly and in fact, it's much more in line with what I would expect of the Gorons. It's not even a real gripe, just a little detail the kid in me was hoping for. And lastly, we've got the Rito, who, just like the rest of the races, live in a place that perfectly represents who they are. The Rito are bird people, first of all, and they're also very quiet and dignified. Their village spirals up a huge rocky pillar and consists of nothing more than stairs, landing platforms, and small wooden huts. The whole thing is very modest in terms of architecture. Even the Rito elder lives in one of these little huts, the singular difference being that his is at the top. You can observe the people here living peacefully, most often indulging in quiet reflection, obviously enjoying the view of the surrounding landscape that their towering town affords. Zora's Domain blew me away with its architecture, but on a more personal level, Rito Village might be my favorite. I won't try to claim that it's as spectacular, but looking at it from a distance and being in it just makes me feel happy. It establishes such a great mood, and it's the only town in the game
game that has its own sort of shape that you can see from the distance, you know? Especially when Va Mado perches on the top, it becomes a very unique landmark. So that's all the architecture that the currently alive people of Hyrule built and are currently enjoying, but perhaps even more interesting is the stuff that's been left behind. Ganon was stopped from completely destroying the world a hundred years ago, but it was a close thing. The vast majority of the world's structures have been reduced to rubble, and you can find these relics of the past everywhere. And this, of course, ties in both with the theme of age and with the atmosphere the developers were trying to establish. And the atmosphere thing is a huge one. I said earlier that the general mood of the game is peaceful without being too ominous or eerie or whatever, and that's certainly true, but Hyrule's ruins elicit another unique kind of feel. Seeing ruins buried under earth and covered in vines and such is a very peaceful thing in real life, and it's no different in the game. It's all just very still, and even if you don't consciously acknowledge it, you know that it's all been there for a very long time. Time, just as quiet and still as always. But beyond that, there's a sadness that runs through the game. You can see the remains of what this place used to be, and if you think on it deeply enough, you imagine all the people that must have died. I mean, there are entire villages that are just... gone. You'll constantly find the broken remains of people's houses, even with some rotted furniture within the crumbled walls. You have to wonder if these people got out in time. I was bummed that I didn't discover this on my own and had to hear about it online, and if you haven't figured it out yet, it's doubtful that you will, so I'm mentioning it here. There's a spot out in Hyrule Field called the Ranch Ruins, and if you look closely, you'll notice that the layout directly matches that of Lon Lon Ranch in Ocarina of Time. Obviously, because of what we know of the timeline, these aren't actually the ruins of that exact version of Lon Lon Ranch, but the callbacks still made me really stop and think when I went and checked them out. It was legitimately heartbreaking to look at the rubble and remember how it once looked. These weren't quite as emotional for me, but Hyrule Castle and Hyrule Castle Town are also very sad. This was once the heart of Hyrule, and this heart has never been depicted so grandly as it is here in its destroyed state. The castle is gargantuan and beautifully constructed. Even ruined and crumbling and covered in black gunk and crawling with baddies as it is, it's a sight to behold. And the sheer size of it once more reminds you of just how many people once lived within the walls. In addition to ruined structures, there are also remnants of the war scattered throughout the land. I can't stress enough how important this addition is to the feel of the game. War hasn't come up much in Zelda games. A few are referenced. We know people once fought over the Triforce. We know Hyrule's Royal Guard have been wiped out a few times. But for the most part, when there's fighting to be done, the hero does it. No one else really takes part. But places like Fort Hiteno make the war a hundred years ago real. This time around, there's a tremendous amount of tangible evidence that the people of Hyrule once had to really fight for their lives. And if you ask me, that makes the lore so much more effective on an emotional level than that of any other Zelda. Lastly, I want to talk about the Temple of Time, because I feel that it's really important in establishing the tone of the game. We're used to the Temple of Time being important. You find the Master Sword there in a number of games. It houses the entrance to the Spirit Realm for Pete's sake. In Breath of the Wild, it's one of the very first things you're drawn to. From the very start of the game, you get to see this Zelda landmark in ruins. It's still technically standing, but it's clear that it's broken beyond repair. The roof is falling in, there are bokoblins squatting inside. It's where the old man eventually reveals his true identity, and it's got one of the game's many statues of Hylia, but that's it. You don't come back later and restore it. You don't travel through time to when it was still intact like in Twilight Princess. You don't do anything with it because it's ruined. It was destroyed in the war and just like most of Hyrule, now it's nothing. And this realization was heavy for me. It communicated perhaps better than anything the extent of the damage caused by Ganon and the senselessness of war. But wait, Arlo, you might be saying, you said earlier that the other games establish bad vibe atmospheres, whereas Breath of the Wild focuses on serenity? What about all this sad stuff you're talking about? Isn't that a pretty bad vibe? Explain yourself. Well, you see, the difference here, and this is completely genius, is that the sadness on display in this version of Hyrule is purely implicit. This game doesn't establish a mood by messing with the lighting or making you all oogged out with ominous music. It doesn't try to scare you or force you into feeling any negative feelings because it's all visual. It's all implied. When you see the remains of a town or Lon Lon Ranch or whatever it is, your own imagination and empathy are what make you feel something. Especially considering all this is set against that very peaceful background backdrop with its relaxing music, it should be very easy to feel nothing but pleasure while you move through the world. But I, at least, have never felt emotions this strong while running through a sunlit field of flowers while I'm serenaded by a delightful piano score. We've got a few more things to cover before we move on to that score, though. Even apart from the land structures, intact or otherwise, the land itself is beautifully constructed. Again, it's not so much a graphical horsepower thing. Nothing in the game looks better than something from Gen 7, and in fact, I've played plenty of Xbox 360 
360 games that look loads better. Though, to the game's credit, the rocks look great. <laughs> I don't know why they put so much detail into the rocks, but man, look at that rock. Point is though, the world is gorgeous because of style and composition. There are certainly some recycled assets here and there. You'll spot a few rocks or whatever and be like, yeah, <laughs> I've definitely seen those around a few times. But for the most part, the entire world looks as though it was figuratively handcrafted. Every hill and valley and mountain, the different ways the plants grow and the trees group together, the different rock formations, it all feels so real. It feels so much like you are walking through a real fantasy landscape rather than a collection of areas compiled by a team of programmers. Nature and landscape and all that in previous games has always been more of an artistic affair. It seemed as though it was all designed by designers who draw out images and help create assets. It always looked great in its own artistic way, don't get me wrong, but it's clear that this time they spent ages studying how nature really works, how a landscape is actually formed geologically. We've had snow places and lava places and desert places and all that in Zelda games before, but never has it felt like I was truly scaling a volcano, or a snowy mountain, or running across a sandy wasteland. Much of this is because of reasons we won't touch on quite yet, but so much of it is plain old incredible design. Much like in our own world, when you're in the middle of nature, you can look in just about any direction and you've got yourself one heck of a painting. There's beauty to be found in every corner of the map. Forget the shrines and the monsters and saving the world and all that junk. I've never been so absorbed by a game's world alone before. Never have I so thoroughly enjoyed just being in it. Skyrim and Shadow of the Colossus came close, those games were really gorgeous, but something about Breath of the Wild's particular style edges them out. When I was a kid, I used to boot up Ocarina of Time just to start at Kakariko Village and climb all the way to the very top of Death Mountain and sit there for a while, admiring the landscape, watching the sun rise and set. It was the first time I ever wanted to be in a game, and Breath of the Wild is probably the only case where that feeling has ever come back just as strongly. Not much more to cover in the visual department, monster designs and animations are stellar as always. The designers gave each of the lesser baddie races that hang around camps and whatnot their own body language, and it gives them a great sense of liveliness. They're all very expressive. The Lizalfos in particular are fun to watch, with their chameleon-like eyes darting around and their hunched composure and the way they curiously tilt their heads all around like birds. The bigger enemies like Hinoxes and Lynels aren't as pleasantly expressive, but they're still well designed. Especially the Lynels. Talk about intimidating. Not as much enemy variety as I would like. Sometimes I do get a little tired staring at the same handful of guys throughout the whole game, but at least what we've got is awesome. Each and every baddie feels really unique and fun. Guardians, shrines, and all the futuristic technology contained within shrines are awesome because they help solidify the game's themes by, interestingly enough, acting as strong contrasts to them. Guardians and shrines are the polar opposite of nearly everything we've been talking about. Most of the game uses soft, warm colors. Everything is made of wood and stone. It all feels very natural. So seeing one of those metal monstrosities skittering around like a spider with its glowing blue eye and its laser beam attack helps heighten tension on top of the tension that naturally comes from confronting a dangerous foe. These things are clearly unnatural. They clearly don't belong here. And it's great because we know that these are very old and yet they're futuristic because of the cyclical nature of Hyrule's tech. Things become very advanced, then for whatever reason, it all gets left behind for later generations to rediscover. We've seen it in a good number of Zelda titles now. Shrines are fun because they're kind of eyesores. <laughs> they're these nasty little glowing protrusions dotting the landscape. They were put in place here by much more advanced people and the rest of the world has since gone on around them. When you step onto that elevator, you leave your world of open sky and green grass and frolicking deer and instantly find yourself in a world of metal and machines and sharp blues. And blue is, of course, the least common color in nature. Even Breath of the Wild sky isn't as blue as it could be with its constant cloud cover, so blue is all the more effective here at representing things that come from a very different time. And with such a large game featuring so many many things to do above ground, shrines with all their blues and machines work to break the game up visually. They sort of refresh your palate with a new set of flavors every once in a while so you don't get tired of the more natural grass and sand and snow and all that. The game would have been perfectly fine without all the future tech stuff, but it adds such a delightful variety to the visuals that it makes the whole experience all the more rich. Also, let's not forget that it's just plain cool. Skyward Sword featured a lot of cool tech stuff, but Breath of the Wild takes it to a whole new level. When you're down in a shrine fighting robots and navigating through lasers and powering machines using big electrical balls, you're basically playing a sci-fi game. And though I doubt it will ever happen, it makes me even more hopeful that maybe someday we'll get a Zelda game that takes place during one of these eras of advanced technology. 
Cyberpunk Zelda, I want it so bad. Finally, we come to music and overall sound design. I don't have too much to say about the sound effects because this is a Zelda game. Even all the way back in Link's first 3D outings with sound as limited as it was on the N64, the game sounded great. These guys know Foley work and they know how to perfectly blend it all into their games and make it sound very natural. Breath of the Wild is of course no exception. There are thousands of different sounds subtly layered into the game and it's all so natural that it's easy to forget that this is a game you're playing. That when Link performs a certain action, that action only makes a noise because someone recorded a noise and stuck it into the code and told the game exactly when to play it. It feels like it just happens on its own. Like, yeah, of course it makes that sound when Link puts away a weapon or throws a rock or whatever. The music, though, does deserve a bit of a closer look. Like most things in the game, it matches the two main themes, age and serenity. For the first time ever, the piano takes center stage versus other Zelda games which have most prominently featured more traditional orchestral instruments such as horns and violins. And music may be another department that Zelda has always excelled in, but never has it been so subtle and natural. Just like the open world with its lack of barriers and loading screens, the music never really ends. It just changes, it moves with you, reflecting your surroundings. And since so much of the surrounding world is filled with serenity and beauty, these soft piano tunes reflect that most often. There are indeed higher tempo songs and ones with stronger melodies and all that, but for the most part, the music in Breath of the Wild takes something of a back seat. Whereas past Zeldas featured a lot of music that had you humming along, this game wants as much as possible to add to the mood without you really thinking about it. It. Familiar melodies are present, but they're often folded into the music in less noticeable ways, and sometimes it took me a little while to catch them. And while sometimes I do miss having the more prominent tunes around, I can't deny the effect this style has on the game's atmosphere and feel. The developers already achieved so much in the visual department, and the music just ties it all together beautifully. It's the sort of thing that I imagine took a long, long time to experiment with and put together, as there are any number of elements that could have broken the mood if done just a little wrong. And like I said, the music also ties into the age theme. This is pretty interesting, and I'll admit, maybe this wasn't intentional at all, and I'm the only one that feels this way, but a lot of that has to do with the use of the piano. From our perspective, the piano and other orchestral instruments were all invented hundreds of years ago. They're old, basically. All of them, in theory, should be able to convey a sense of age. They're almost exclusively used to score movies and shows and games that take place in the past, at least in the Western world, but Breath of the Wild uses its piano in a different way. Instead of emulating the long ago days of grand classical music, it sometimes emulates a more recent time. More frequently being used as a solo instrument versus violins and horns and all that, it suggests a greater level of intimacy that calls, to my mind at least, the idea of smaller scale storytelling as seen in the 18 and 1900s. Picture plays and silent movies where the pianist sits off to the side and single-handedly scores entire productions. This is where the age theme comes in, which is funny because Breath of the Wild sometimes alludes to events that took place untold thousands of years in the past, yet like I said, its color palette often brings to mind old photos. There's a really big emphasis on what happened a hundred years ago. And here's a detail I didn't mention before, but whenever Link recovers a memory, there's this effect that makes it look like an old silent movie for a second. Silent movies were being made about a hundred years ago now, which makes this even more appropriate, seeing as Link's memories were a century old. Back to the music though, the piano strengthens this concept. It conveys a sense of age by subconsciously stirring up images of plays and silent movies in my mind. The single greatest example of this is the theme that plays when you encounter a guardian stalker. In any other Zelda game, spotting a foe like this might have just started up more of those horns and cellos, but here we get exactly the sort of jaunty piano tune you would hear in an old film about cowboys and bandits. Imagine an old-timey melodrama where a mustache-twiddling bad guy ties a helpless gal to the railroad tracks. Or imagine a kid up on a stage running around in a Guardian costume while their teacher pounds on the piano off to the side. That's what I think of when I hear the Guardian music. Now, the whole theme does include more than just the piano. It has a handful of future touches, and there's a violin in there helping carry things along, but that piano is at the forefront, especially right at the start when one of the things first spots you. That five-note motif just pounds away repeatedly. And they could have easily ditched the piano entirely and use nothing but futuristic music here, like the kind they put down in the shrines. These guardians are way, way older than just a century or two after all, yet they tie into that story of a Hyrule at war from a hundred years ago, and because of my subconscious associations with that kind of piano tune, they feel like they fit more with the theme of age than if the style had been purely futuristic or even something actually older like a regular orchestration. Perhaps it's because I'm so used to futuristic themes being tied to big robots, or maybe I'm desensitized to traditional orchestra 
orchestral music, I don't know, but this unusual style is really effective. It makes me imagine how a hundred years after the events of Breath of the Wild, people will be telling each other stories about how Link fought the Guardians. Finally, one more notable thing Breath of the Wild does in the music department is using very ambient sounds and instruments. Plenty of piano, as we've established, and plenty of instances of more traditional instrumentation as well. But listening through the soundtrack, I'm amazed by how much of it truly falls into the ambient category, like the kind of stuff you hear in various genres of ambient music. Sounds that you can only get using a computer to generate waves and shift and stretch stuff in all sorts of weird ways. This naturally adds hugely to the serenity, and the fact that it's a pretty new thing for Zelda games increases the impact it has. Its otherworldly nature lets you know that you're playing a very different kind of Zelda game. And the funny thing is, despite how awesome I think it is, it took me a long time to notice. It's extremely subtle, and sometimes when music complements gameplay and a game world perfectly and helps establish just the right mood, I don't even notice that it's there. It affects me even though I'm not really thinking about it. And I tell ya, that is the mark of an awesome soundtrack right there. When taken as a whole, Breath of the Wild's presentation is really something else. It's easily the most ambitious Zelda in terms of how much love and care and time went into it, and how it all ties together. It's the most stylistically cohesive by a wide margin. The atmosphere it establishes is something truly special, and never have I played a game that made me stop and marvel as often as this one does, even on other, more powerful systems. The dev team made so much out of relatively little, and more than ever, they've shown that yes, these games are art, and yes, the people working on them are art. Artists.